Hi, uh, folks. Welcome, um, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today um, for this incredibly important and timely conversation. Um, we're very excited to have you guys. My name is Amanda Clore, and I'm the campaigns director with Parents Together. And I'm also a mom of two kids. Um, and we're really looking forward to talking a little bit today about parent experiences with tech harms. Technology has been um, a bigger part of a lot of our kids' lives this past year than it ever has before. And I know for some of us, it has been like a lifesaver. It's let our kids connect with family and friends, and it's really kept them entertained during lockdowns. Um, but for many of us, we're also becoming really concerned with these apps and websites that are pretty much taking over our kids' lives. We're worried they're addictive, that they're manipulative, that they're racially biased, that they take too much data from our kids and use it to target them with ads, um, that they're at the end of the day unsafe. Um, and many parents are not even aware of the full range of harms done by these companies because they often collect and sell kids' private information without asking parent permission first. So today, parents and other people who care about kids' privacy are fighting back with the launch of the End Child Surveillance Campaign. You can visit our site at endchildsurveillance.com, that's endchildsurveillance.com, to see some of our initial asks and petitions. Um, we have a pretty amazing group of folks here today. Um, we're going to start by hearing from Leah Holland, the Campaigns and uh, Communications Director for Fight for the Future. And then I'll introduce uh, a few parents who will briefly share their family's personal experiences with tech. Um, and then we'll hear from Dr. Sarah Domoff about the psychological impacts of harmful tech on kids. Um, after that, we'll have plenty of opportunity for the folks on the call to ask questions. Um, and to before we kick things off, I'm going to hand it over to Joe from Fight for the Future. And Joe's going to give people some technical instructions on the webinar um, and make sure everyone knows how to ask questions. So take it away, Joe. Hey, my name is Joe. I am the video producer here at Fight for the Future, and I'll be running tech on this webinar. Um, for members of the press, um, please feel free to stack in the chat um, to ask questions at the end. Um, and for folks on YouTube, feel free to just ask your questions right in the chat, um, right on YouTube, and um, we will we will get to you um, as as we go through the questions. Um, so that and that that's that's basically how uh, how we'll do the the Q and A portion of this. Thank you so much, Joe, uh, for helping us make uh, all of the tech work for us. Um, I am very happy to introduce Leah Holland, Campaigns and Communications Director for Fight for the Future, who's going to talk a little bit about this issue overall before we hear some of our personal experiences. So take it away, Leah. Thanks so much, Amanda. It's a complete honor to work with parents together on these issues. Fight for the Future is a digital rights organization that has been part of a chorus of privacy focused organizations that have been warning for years that the surveillance based business model of tech platforms is harmful and dangerous. We're now seeing these issues come to a head in a big way with research showing that the decline of kids mental health alongside the rise of the kids ad market, which is now valued at $1.7 billion in the United States. At the same time, the companies that are harming kids are not the internet itself, and the internet has so much potential for good. We believe in a world where kids can have empowering digital lives without being exploited by tech companies, which is what's happening right now. Kids are among the most vulnerable, vulnerable people online, vulnerable to manipulation, scams, data extraction, and disinformation. Yet the harms of these platforms to kids are difficult to expose and quantify because kids don't often don't know to speak up about being harmed online. And many of the harms are made invisible by the companies that are perpetrating them. Tech companies are spending a lot of money and effort right now to equity wash, green wash, and safety wash products that are built for the purpose of surveilling and analyzing children, spying on them and spying on them for profit. But we are thankful to report that fewer and fewer parents, educators, and legislators are falling for the snake oil promises of these companies, which is why we are helping parent activists to launch inchildsurveillance.com and defend their kids' lifetime privacy, mental health, 
and safety. There have been many false starts and patchy fixes to protecting kids online, as well as harmful legislation that protects kids in name only. Just this month, Facebook was caught letting advertisers target kids for pill parties and anorexia. Um, and these are kids who are as young as 13 years old. Uh, it's clear that we cannot trust the companies that brought us here in the first place. And so the demands and focus areas of nchildsurveillance.com track with the stop spying on kids.com open letter, uh, which makes, uh, which is signed by 18 organizations making privacy first demands that restore kids rights to privacy, which is really entangled with their right to be kids at all. The focus areas are as follows. One, addictive apps are currently entrapping kids with what some legislators call a wasteland of vapid content. But this content isn't just vapid, it's harmful. On YouTube, for example, addictive algorithms are showing how kids end up watching gory videos of My Little Pony characters being beheaded. Uh, because with 500 hours of video uploaded per minute, it is impossible to meaningfully moderate content with an algorithm. The scale is simply too large. We need to ban addictive app features entirely. Two, voyeuristic advertising is the bread and butter of tech companies surveillance based business model. They spy on what kids do online, even in school and on school issued devices and create a master profile of kids interests, even inferring information like sexual orientation and whether their parents are divorced. This is how a child who shows interest in diet food or weight loss exercises ends up being served pro anorexia ads. These master profiles may be sold or hacked and follow kids their whole lives, which is why we need to ban voyeuristic micro-targeted ads and limit the sort of data that can be collected on people. Three, educational stalker stalkerware is one of the latest and greatest venues for unethical companies to extract money from institutions that are supposed to serve children while subjecting them to biased and invasive surveillance tech that makes them less safe. This week, an article from Vice detailed how companies like Verkata, a company that was hacked to expose live feeds at hospitals and schools just this March, and companies like Motorola are aggressively trying to get K-12 schools to spend their COVID relief money on facial recognition, license plate readers, and other surveillance tech. A study presented the, to the American Educational Research Association in 2021 found that students who attend high surveillance schools are less likely to attend college. And finally, number four, <laughs> we address the issue of chronic surveillance. There is a misconception out there that surveilled kids are safe kids, while science is more and more revealing that the opposite is true. It used to be that only so-called trusted institutions like banks could afford cameras, but now anyone can and anyone can hack these, those cameras in a digitally connected world. This brings about circumstances where, for example, kids who walk to school alone could be picked out based on their appearance using Amazon Ring surveillance network, the same cameras that hackers infamously used to tell a little girl in her bedroom that they were Santa. It is a, it's a major part of our goal here to end the lie that constant surveillance makes kids safer because in a digital world, that just isn't the case. We now, have, we, we now have more to fear from the dangerous and manipulative situations surveillance places kids in. So it's far fast, past time to put kids' privacy first and eliminate these companies' ability to profit off of spying on kids. We are excited to work with these parent activists uh, and like our parent activists like those you're about to hear from to craft petitions, stunts, and more to continue to demand strong privacy protection and the end to tech exploitation of our children. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, those are some really chilling examples. I know as the, the mom of a couple of very enthusiastic My Little Pony in, uh, lovers, uh, some of those I, I just uh, sort of give me goosebumps. Um, I would love to pass the mic to Jen. Uh, Jen is the mother of a 10 year old um, and she is gonna tell us a little bit about her child's recent experience playing Roblox. Jen is on the phone. Um, so Jen, if you can talk, please take it away. Uh, Jen, if you're talking, we can't hear you. Can 
you might need to press star six on your phone to unmute yourself. On the call. Hmm. Uh, Joe, Jen is having trouble t getting off mute. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm sorry about that. I've I've um, enabled uh, Jen to join in with the panelists, but uh, hello, there we oh, go. Hey, we can hear you. Oh, there now. I am. <laughs> Yay! There I am. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a daughter who's ten, and we started letting her play Roblox on the Xbox. You know, during this whole quarantine when it all began, because she is the only child, so we want her to keep in contact with her friends. But we put the app on her phone, which was probably a mistake. And now that's all she wants to do. She'll come home from school, goes up in a room, and won't have any contact with me or her dad except for dinner. And then Saturdays and Sundays, she's on the phone all day long playing these games. We put a timer on her phone, but somehow she figured out how to change her password and her account and everything. So... The reason she's basically playing is because they say if you get so many diamonds, you can get this outfit or whatever. So she wants to keep playing more and more and more. But then she asks us for real money so she can buy, you know, these outfits or whatever. And normally we say no, or if she gets off the phone, she becomes very crabby with us. She snaps. But normally she's a very good little girl, so I don't know why she's getting so angry when we make her get off. But I've also realized, or I've also noticed that people, I don't know if they're adults, I don't know, but there's people on here swearing at her, like F you and all this other stuff. And then she'll go upstairs and she'll be playing her game, but then she'll watch Roblox on TV where it shows all these adults playing. And my main concern is that these adults are trying to get into your kid's chat room to talk to you and give you or have them give information out about where they live or anything. So that's why I make is there's these older people trying to get in contact with her. Thanks so much for sharing that, Jen. And it sounds like um, she it sounds like she's being offered sort of like some prizes or rewards in the game. Is that something that's happening? Um, yeah, she uh, She's like, well, she'll just say like, oh, I had to do this game because I had to get this outfit or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the outfits, <laughs> the outfits are so skimpy. They have like thigh highs and high heels and corsets. I'm just like, she goes, mama, I need this corset. I'm like, for the love of God. <laughs> so I'm afraid that she's going to, you know, take these clothing ideas and try to wear them because she's getting into a stage where she seems like she's more influenced by what her friends are wearing mm -hmm. and everything else. So that's concerning to me. So it's, uh, it's a headache. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experiences, Jen. And I'm sorry, that sounds like a real source of stress for your family um, and a really tough yeah. thing to be, be going through right now. Um, mm -hmm. I would love to um, introduce our next speaker, uh, Sean. Sean is the father of a 10 year old and a three year old. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about his experiences using apps with his daughter. Uh, Sean, uh, feel free to take it away. Okay, thanks Amanda. Um, yeah, so as Amanda said, I have two kids, a 10 year old daughter and a, a three year old son. And my daughter's early experiences with uh, technology led me to uh, do a couple of things. So I'm, I'm an author, I've written a book about uh, the subject and some of my daughter's early experiences uh, with technology. And then I've also uh, actually founded a tech company and we're building um, products for uh, kids under the age of 13 that are privacy first and, and safe. Um, the reason I did that is surveying the market. Um, there were no solutions other than those coming from uh, big tech companies. And I could just never reconcile uh, the business model, uh, which was really everything is based on growth and engagement. And um, that targeting into uh, the child segment just never uh, added up for me. So I've been doing a lot of uh, extensive research on the subject of like persuasive technology and, and growth hacking and, and the dopamine cycle and how tech companies use that to keep us um, kind of hooked on the feed and, and sticking around uh, for longer and longer. So I was 
quite deep into the subject, quite uh, getting quite knowledgeable. And when my daughter was seven, um, the alarming thing for me is when I started to see some of those same patterns uh, showing up in apps that were actually uh, targeted to kids. And the um, there's one app called Pop Jam, for instance, which is kind of a social feed. It's almost like an in Instagram for kids, which as we know is also coming. Um, but the really concerning uh, thing about that was it allowed her to um, level up and reward based on getting additional followers or getting likes on her content. And uh, the subject of my book is kind of above all else with um, technology and kids above, you know, the obvious stuff of, of um, you know, strangers reaching out and, and things like that. But what I worry about most as a parent is um, social validation and, and kids starting to measure themselves and their, their self-worth um, based on these kind of vanity metrics around likes and followers and, and these sort of things. So in the context of rising depression rates and anxiety rates, um, nothing is really proven in terms of causation versus uh, correlation, um, but the smell test, and I think there's a lot of indicators that these things are very meaningful to kids. And I think it's a problem when it's a teen segment uh, but even more so with apps that are targeting kids as young as, you know, seven years old, six, seven years old. So that's, uh, that's my story. And that's why I ended up, you know, writing a book and getting into the, into the tech scene. Thank you so much for sharing, Swan, and just incredibly important points too, about how um, th this kind of technology affects kids' mental health and mental well-being overall. Um, I'd love to next introduce Dr. Janice Wyatt Ross, who's been a special education teacher and administrator in K through 12 schools for 26 years. And she's gonna talk a little bit about her daughter's recent experience with online proctoring software. Hello, my daughter's a little bit older. She is a second year in college. I have another daughter that's a first year in college. But um, my daughter called me one day, asked, exasperated. She had to take a quiz for one of her courses and it was online and the quiz was supposed to be completed by 8 p.m. She, in her infinite wisdom, she thought to uh, attempt the quiz earlier in the day when the noon sun was shining directly into her dorm room window. So that's what she did. She pulled up the um, computer software and you had to do a, a trial. The first thing was a 360 degree scan of her room. So the software had to scan her dorm room to see what was going on around her, issue number one. Uh, issue number two, it had to detect her face. And it took, according to her, 30 trials before it could detect her face. Again, this was noon, around noon, she had her windows up and two overhead lights. It said there was a glare, so she adjusted the windows, adjusted the lights, still wouldn't work, turned on her lamp, still wouldn't work, turned off her lamp, adjusted everything, stood up, it finally just stood up in the middle of her room to take the practice quiz. So she took the practice quiz, which was three questions, and um, then she said, I'm not standing in the middle of my dorm room for 30 minutes to take this test. So she sat down at her desk, and attempted to take the actual quiz, still could not recognize her face. She again adjusted all the windows, the lights, the lamps, and that wouldn't work. So she finally thought my husband, her dad gave her a LED uh, flashlight. So she got the flashlight and she turned the flashlight on to illuminate her face. Voila, it worked. So she held the flashlight in one hand, took the quiz, um, with the other hand. And after she finished, she was totally, totally frustrated. So called me just to vent. And, you know, we asked her what would have been your alternative had that not worked? She said, well, I don't know what my alternative would have been because I, the only other option was to go into the hallway and I can't go into, hall, into the hallway because of COVID because I have to wear a mask. So I don't know what my option would have been after then. So that, um, that's our story. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for sharing that. And I can't imagine trying to remember like biology information after going through something like that. Like it's, that's a, just a horrible sort of set of experiences to have to take a high pressure test or quiz under. So thank you for sharing. 
Um, our next parent to speak um, is going to be Jim Schultz. Um, Jim is a part of the community of Lockport, New York, and is going to share some recent experiences um, with uh, facial recognition and surveillance systems at the school there. Jim? Hey, everyone. Can you hear me okay? We can, Andy, we can, can hear, hear me? We can hear you, Jim. Hi. So uh, I, live in, uh, I live in Lockport, New York, which is a small city in Western New York uh, near Niagara Falls. Uh, I have a daughter who is a senior in high school. And in her freshman year in high school, I discovered by accident, really, that the school district was about to spend $2.7 million on a facial recognition surveillance system. Remember, this is a district that has uh, you know, 4,000 students where we have one high school. So this is a huge amount of money and nobody was paying any attention to this. And what we discovered was that this security, this guy who had represented himself as a security consultant and said, gosh, ever since Sandy Hook, I just really want to help schools out with safety. So they, uh, they basically listened to this guy and it turned out he had, he was a financial partner in the company selling these facial recognition surveillance systems. And so Lockport became the first school district in the country to put a facial recognition surveillance system inside of its school. And they never consulted with anybody in the community. They just did it. And we found out, number one, it's a complete waste of money because it doesn't actually do anything to keep students safe. If you put a mask on it like this, nobody can see you. Uh, it doesn't work. It is notoriously bad at um, over-reporting the faces of uh, Black students. Uh, it also uh, turned out was misreporting that it had spotted guns in the school. Uh, and it also kept a record of all of the movements of the students that could be retroactively searched later to map out their associations and their movements in the schools. So we were not able to get the school district to disband the system. They dug in their heels. So instead, what we did is we took the issue statewide and teaming up with the New York Civil Liberties Union, we were able to get a bill passed into law this last December, which freezes these systems, not just in Lockport, but everywhere in the state of New York for two years until the implications of this can be studied. Um, I have put in the chat box links to two New York Times articles. One is an op-ed on this that I wrote, and the other is the feature story on this battle in Lockport that this border. Um, Renee Cheatham just texted me, who is a member of the school board, um, the only African-American member of the school board, and she is having some connection issues. And so it doesn't look like she's gonna be on, but she wanted to let you know that this is an important issue for her and especially for the African-American community here. Uh, thank you so much, Jim. And if uh, Renee is able to solve her technical issues and join us, um, we certainly will be very excited to hear from her as well. Um, uh, thank you so much to all of the parents who shared your experiences. Um, I know, you know, as a fellow parent, uh, it's really important to uh, ground this kind of work in the real lived experiences of families. And um, we really value your time in sharing those. I would love I see to. Renee. Oh, Renee is here. Great, Renee. Oh um, my God, that was a struggle. <laughs> we we can hear you now, Renee. Would you um, like to to make a couple comments about what's been going on in Lockport? Oh, I sure would. Oh my God, I'm so glad I got on. Um, I just want to say um, how much I appreciate you guys. You know, I mean, for everybody that really pulling together and fighting for our kids and it's, it's just been a whirlwind. Um, there's just so much, um, issues when it comes to the surveillance and, and, um, you know, with falsely identifying the, the kids and what it does to them, how it traumatizes them when they're accused of uh, something that they haven't done you know, or um, just their experience alone at being in school with that type of 
policing and that type of mindset, um, it doesn't do anything um, to their self-esteem, to how they feel about themselves. It's making them feel like they're criminals, you know? I mean, and then I don't know um, how you guys feel about it, but we also have um, security there that's set up with retired police officers that want to be armed with guns now. And so that's a, a whole nother um, avenue. But I have kids that don't even want to go back to school. Um, one of uh, um, the girls there, um, she's going to be, she's in 10th grade right now. Her grades have gone down terribly because her father was one of the, um, her father was murdered here in Lockport by one of the police officers here. There was four police officers that were here. Um, and her name is Tamara Hodge. And she is traumatized by that then to have to go to school and try to learn with you know previously that one of the officers worked for the schools so she had to not only face this trauma of losing her father but she also had to go to school and look at him you know go to the he was a football coach go to the football games and have to be reminded of the, of this trauma that she lives with every day you know, I mean, and then there's, there's kids that, you know, are um, just not, they're not putting the money and the time into their mental health, you know, I mean, and it's serious, it's serious, and it's starting at a younger age, you know, I mean, when, when the kids first go to school, you know, they're, 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 when they go there to learn and experience should be experience that is enjoyable in a lifetime instead of a, a lifetime of uh, feeling that you've gone to school your whole life with, with that police officers in the school. And is that really protecting you? And is this surveillance really protecting? I mean, who's it protecting? You know, it's protecting the, the pockets of retired police officers because that's the ones who are running the system. And, it, and that's part of the school to prison pipeline because the majority of the kids that are going to fail are going to, um, be put in that system is going to be the black and brown kids. Let's just face it. They're the ones that are looked at as threats. They're the ones that are looked at as criminals, you know, and it's sad. It's really sad. And that's not what I sent my son to school for. I sent my son to school to learn and to be able to learn at a safe environment, not in an environment that seems like you're going to prison. You know, they don't want to feel like that. They go to school to have fun, you know, and, you know, and just face it. I mean, a lot of it too, we need diversity into that school. We need to look at, at that too, as well. I mean, it's, it's traumatizing to go to school all your life and never have a black uh, or brown teacher that can, you can relate to, you know, especially as black males, black males are targeted and that, that is, it's a problem with the black and brown kids. It really is. And we need to do better, you know? Well, thank you so much. I'm so glad that we got to hear from you, Renee, and that we solved yeah. the, the technical issues. And, and thank you so much, you and Jim, for the amazing work that you guys are doing in Lockport. Thank you. And thank you too, as well. You yes. Know? Appreciate <laughs> um, you. And I'm very excited to next introduce uh, Dr. Sarah Domoff, um, who is a licensed psychologist and associate professor in the Department of Psychology at, um, oops, excuse me, I lost my note where I was going to read her introduction properly, um, at the Department of Psychology at Central Michigan University and a research faculty affiliate at the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan. She also established the Problematic Media Assessment and Treatment Clinic at the Center for Children, Families, and Communities at CMU, where she trains clinicians, school personnel, and other providers in promoting healthy digital media use amongst children and adolescents. So we're very fortunate to have her here with us, and she's going to share a little bit about the psychological ramifications of some of these uh, harms. Dr. Domoff? Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to these issues. As we've heard from parents today, and as I've learned through my research, clinic and partnerships with schools and community organizations, managing the risks to children online and navigating these barriers to healthy and pro-social engagement is stressful, overwhelming, and requires advanced and ongoing mediation. 
We have known for years now that nearly half of parents are concerned about their children's excessive use and how to help them have a balanced life with technology. My research on problematic use and other international studies have found that approximately 10% of youth who use social media experience problems with dysregulated use, such as disrupted sleep, um, poor quality relationships, and family conflict because of use. And we've heard about that, some, some of that today. Um, in addition, we learned that there's negative online interactions across different types of apps, whether they be gaming or social media. Um, so an even larger proportion of youth experience things such as cyber victimization, sextortion, or the coercion to send private, personal, or inappropriate photos to others. These experiences contribute to shame, feelings of, of helplessness, hopelessness, and in some cases, suicidal ideation. You know, it's become apparent to me and other child health researchers that we, all, we need a hands-on, all hands-on-deck approach. Um, everyone needs to come together to address these issues. These challenges cannot be solved solely by parents and teachers. We need support from tech companies to make this happen. The experiences of children and families during the pandemic further underscore these concerns. We know um, from the research from Parents Together that children are spending more hours online, um, there's greater mental health concerns, and there's greater challenges to mediation or managing um, a child's engagement with activities or games or social media online. We know that families living under stressful economic conditions and children who already have underlying mental health concerns are at greater risk for problematic or dysregulated use, really highlighting that we have a vulnerable population here that is being preyed upon. To help children and families who cannot afford the technological protections and do not have the time to be able to stand over their children every day while they're on a screen. Uh, we need support and we need to address this. Um, and the families that are really suffering um, are often not heard. So I really appreciate parents together to fight for the future to address these issues and hopefully advocate for major change. Thank, Thank you. you so much uh, mm -hmm. for that really critical analysis, Dr. Domoff. Um, I think that we really need to think about um, all of this with the lens of how it is impacting certainly the most vulnerable kids. Um, we are now going to open it up for questions. If you would like to ask a question, you can please just either pop it in the YouTube chat if you're watching on YouTube um, or if you are signed into Zoom in the Zoom chat. Um, I would love to just start with a question um, for all the parents that we've been talking to, which is we sort of laid out a lot of the really deep concerns that exist today. Um, and one of the problems, I think, is that a lot of the onus for keeping kids safe online has fallen on parents' shoulders. Um, it's parents' job to set parental controls, check in to make sure that kids aren't doing things, um, look over kids' shoulders, know who their friends are online. Do you feel like parents are adequately equipped with the necessary tools and controls from these companies in order to do even part of that job? Or do you think that there's space for tech companies um, to improve their options that help parents keep the kids safe in their home too? And I'm happy to take anyone who wants to give a shot at that answer. I think I will, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. Um, as a parent, I did take on that responsibility because they are my children. And if nobody else cares for them, that's my responsibility. And when Jen was talking about her daughter, I was reflecting on an article that I had written in 2015, uh, which was published in Huffington Post. And I talked about how the smartphones, they had a bedtime and their bedtime was in my room. So every night at nine o'clock, my girls' smartphones would go to bed. They needed some time away. I didn't want them on their phones all day and all night. So at night, when they were in sixth grade through maybe the second semester of high school, of senior year, they those smartphones, that technology came to my bedroom. So that was my way of protecting them. And there are some features when I was talking about the, the scan that my daughter had to perform before she could take her quiz. 
according to the tech company, that is at the discretion of the professor. So the professor could have gone in and deactivated that function. Don't know whether the professor knew that or not, but there are some, there are a lot of hidden features that are set by default. So the, I, I, as a parent, I have a responsibility and as a tech company, they have a responsibility and the user, whoever the user is, whether it's the teacher or whomever, they have a responsibility to investigate these systems before they utilize them. Thank you. That's uh, super good to hear. And I love the idea of, of a smartphone bedtime. Um, as a, as a follow-up to that, um, for, for Jim and Renee, um, what tools do you guys have to protect your kids as parents in Lockport um, that might be an alternative to the surveillance systems that you guys have been trying to remove from the schools? I think that I'd like to hear from Renee talk about really the, she's as good a voice as any on this issue of using the resources for mental health support as opposed to cops with guns and surveillance yeah. systems. Yes, and I feel that um, that is what the issue is, is we're not taking the money, putting it into resources that the kids need. If these kids need um, for safety, for their mental health, so that's part of their safety, they need to have people that are put in place to be able to assist these kids properly. Like, to me, I feel like my husband, he works for the school, and that's what we need more of. We need more people that care about the kids, that love the kids, that are going to engage in their and their feelings and what's going on. I like nobody has really taken the time really to get to know kids and get to know what they're feeling. And that's a very important thing right now. Oh, Renee, I think um, you're a little frozen for us. We might be losing you. Um, I think Renee might be having some technical difficulties. Um, so hopefully uh, we'll get her back in a minute. Um, and while we wait for Renee to come back, uh, we do have a question coming in from YouTube, um, which is a question about um, how the business models of social media platforms in particular harm kids. Um, so Leah, I'm wondering if you uh, would wanna take a first pass at that one. Yeah, absolutely. So the business models that we're talking about here are um, business models that are based and profiting from collecting data on kids, whether that data is about what they're interested in online so that they can serve ads to those children, or if that data is, you know, surveillance data at Lockport, for example, of, you know, what, what kids are doing day to day. Um, that could potentially be digitized in the future and turned into more ad data. <laughs> um, so, so, so the, 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 the crux of the issue here is that all of these companies, whether they're surveillance vendors, uh, whether they're selling security cameras and facial recognition, or whether they're um, sell, selling ads on YouTube, are all motivated um, and, and by the concept of making money by knowing as much as they can about kids, their families, their interests, their curiosities, their personal lives, collecting all that data in a big pool and then using it over and over again to, um, to sell different forms of analysis, whether that's like this kid is interested in diet, so let's go ahead and let an anorexia, <laughs> like anorexia influencer serve them ads. Or, um, you know, this kid tagged lockers in high school or in middle school, and let's sell that data to um, admissions offices so that they know that this kid is a, a quote unquote social deviant or what have you. Um, there, there's such an economy now in collecting this information and then just repackaging it and repackaging it to sell to different people in ways that are really harmful and that there is no meaningful way for parents to defend their kids against or consent to. And um, that's the business model that unites all of these different stories that we've heard today is that it's about collecting the data and then repackaging it to profit. 
And Sean, I'm wondering if you want to share any thoughts on this too, because I know you've done a lot of writing, particularly on, on the business model side of things. Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, if you don't pay for it, you are the product um, at the end of the day. Social media platforms, they are... Uh, like make no mistake, they don't work for you, me, our kids, they work for the advertisers and they're always looking to optimize advertising revenue and they're looking at uh, optimize engagement on the platform. So they want us to stick on, around on the platform as long as we can, click as many things as we can. And this holds true for you, me, or our kids. And the issue that I have is when we start to see that kind of retrofitting back into the kids segment, it all holds true, but there hasn't been nearly enough uh, research done on what the negative effects of that might be. And, and I think with children, I always argue that um, privacy and safety are much more coupled than when we're adults. So I can have a privacy issue when I'm an adult. It doesn't necessarily put me in danger. Uh, I don't think that that always holds true for kids. So when it comes to business model, I, I think the reminder is like, we're the product. They're trying to put ads in front of us as much as, as possible. As Leah said, they're always trying to gain as much information about us as they can. This holds true for us and our kids. And the big platforms are only ever going to do, you know, the bare minimum of, of what they need to do uh, when it comes to privacy and, and safety and, and those kind of regulations, because they're just not properly motivated to, to do anymore. Thank you. That's really helpful context to hear. Um, my next question is for Dr. Damoff. Um, I'm interested, Dr. Damoff, when you sort of think about the, the implications or the ramifications of some of the app features that exist now and some of the ones that we've heard might be coming down the road, like what keeps you up at night? What are the ones that you're the most worried about from a mental health perspective for some of the communities that you work with? I would definitely say, I guess more recently, some of the content that has me really concerned um, is the extreme content. And so you each with the algorithms, you, you want people to, well, the companies want children to stay on longer. And so they are being shown videos that are more extreme and more extreme to keep them watching. And just, you know, we're always concerned about the content that our, our children um, consume, whether it be on TV or, or online. And there's, a great concern for me about vulnerable youth being exposed to content that shapes their behaviors, shapes how they think about themselves and is extreme and frightening. Um, and so, you know, to kind of follow up on some of the, the other comments made earlier, you know, a big part of the interventions we, we do with parents um, and that we provide at schools is just simply how do we help them manage this overwhelming amount of content that they have to mediate and protect children from. And it's, it's, it's overwhelming. Um, and, and we can help parents um, as, as much as we can, but it is, um, it's an unending cycle of content that is harmful. So it's, it's a long process, it's an unending process and we need support and from the tech companies to make this uh, easier uh, for us to navigate this because the content this extreme violent and sexual nature is what has me really concerned currently. That is um, terrifying for me as a parent thinking about my kids uh, seeing some of that extreme content online and um, also really motivating to figure out how we can get some of these platforms to uh, not be promoting that kind of content actively. Um, Renee, we have back. Um, <laughs> do you wanna to finish your comment? And then I think we, it might be almost time to wrap up unless we have one final question. Okay. Um, I just, um, I don't know how much you heard, but I was just saying that um, some of the resources need to be put put into the, the schools more. Um, and even, even if it's online or even if it's um, uh, in person, they need more um, um, social workers, more um, psychologists, more people to, um, to intervene um, and, you know, um, more programs into for the kids so they can help build up their self-esteem and build up their self-worth. Some of the kids are just so broken. I mean, these are, uh, we have in Lockport, like just a diverse community. And, you know, these kids come from families where 
they don't have the little white picket fence home with the mom and the dad. They have aunts maybe raising them, grandparents maybe raising them, um, a home full of aunts, uncles, uh, grandmothers, grandpa. I mean, it's they're big, big families with big, you know, big issues, you know, and it's like these kids um, come to school for a safe haven. They come to school to, um, you know, and I'm saying this and I'm speaking this because my husband works in the schools and he is what's called a conflict resolution coach. And I think that's what we need more of, you know, let's get to the underground root of the problem with the kids. Um, you know what I'm saying? Talk to them, find out what's going on. And some of it is just a mere, you know, um, feeling of rejection, you know, and then but for somebody to come up to them and care, it makes a whole different child. You know what I'm saying? You took that extra moment just to talk, talk to them and let them know you're there for them and let them know, you know, let's see what we can do to help this situation, you know? I mean, there's more than to just providing uh, free lunches and free um, uh, free breakfasts. Oh, you get to take home this free. Yeah, you might be providing those meals for these kids, but let's find out what the underlying problem is. You know what I'm saying? That uh, some some of the kids they're 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 left alone by themselves at at you know in the evening because the parents have to work. Some of them, you know. Um, they're split up, you know, in foster care. I mean, there's a lot of issues that need to be addressed with these kids. And a, a lot of it affects, you know, their learning, you know, so. Um, well, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, and, okay. Uh, and I just, and I have to go because I okay. have to get back to work, but I really, pre like I said, appreciate the work you guys are doing. Thank you very much. And I didn't get to talk to everybody on, I don't know who's all on, but. My name's Renee Cheatham, and you guys feel free to even ever reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. And we we also are uh, sadly at the end of our time here today. So I just wanted to say one more huge thank you for all of the parents who joined us, uh, to Dr. Domoff, uh, to Leah and Joe at Fight for the Future for making this possible. Um, uh, if you would like to check out the website, uh, the campaign is nchildsurveillance.com. You can click to learn more and to join um, and we are very excited uh, to be part of this fight together, working to make technology safer for all of our kids. So thank you very much and have a wonderful rest of your Thursday.